Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I'd like to say a happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the building this morning. Thank you, buddy. And um, if your uh, father is not with you this morning, and um, maybe you are having a tough day today, that was such a fitting song to sing for it. I, um, I appreciate, the, appreciate the worship team putting that together this morning. All our days are held within your hands. We're going to trust the perfect wisdom of His plan. He is everlasting God. From, from before the foundations of the earth were ever laid, He is God. And after the foundations of the earth are destroyed, He will still be God. And He knows exactly what He's doing. Even in all the little intricate details of all of our lives, He knows exactly what He's doing. And we've learned to trust Him. I would like to ask you this morning, if you would, to... Um, Please be in prayer for the um, for the Clifton family. That's um, Miss Sharon Clifton. Um, just don't know how much time she has left, but this is Miss Frances King's sister, uh, Faye B's sister. Um, so, uh, Miss Sharon, y'all probably remember she used to be a part of this church uh, for many years, and so I, I know some of you here will remember her. But just uh, be in prayer for that family, if you will, as they. Um, as they just sit by the side of their loved one waiting to see what the good Lord is going to do in her life. And then um, also today being Father's Day, we will not have uh, our grief class today. So if you are part of that, uh, we normally have grief class at 2 p.m. on Sundays. We will not do that today. We will cancel that for today and reschedule it to begin again next Sunday. At, um, no, we won't either, will we? Um, we will, to be determined, we will figure that out. All right. If you have your Bibles this morning, I pray that you do. Um, turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 3. As uh, Stevie read this morning, that's where we're going to be coming from for our message on this Father's Day. thought it was very fitting that um, we were in Isaiah and um, it just lined up to where I felt like this was a very fitting Father's Day message. And so I love the way that God just puts it together. We were able to come from the end of Isaiah for Mother's Day and now we're in the beginning of Isaiah for Father's Day. And I just love to watch God, how He pieces together and He feeds His sheep. And um, He knows exactly what we need at any given time and puts us exactly where we need to be. But um, if you would, we have an outline this morning. If you um, didn't get it, you can get on our Facebook page. This is the only time your preacher is going to give you permission to get on Facebook in the middle of his message, all right? But um, on our Wells Baptist Facebook page, we do share our outline. And so if you're visiting this morning and you want an outline to go by and you didn't get one, um, you can go to our Facebook page and it will be on there. If uh, you're a member and you get our church-wide text messages, you can click a link, you can get it there. Or as, um, it's usually sitting around here somewhere in paper form as well. But I believe that will help you to see what we're doing and what the Lord is doing as He speaks to us this morning. If y'all will, let's go to Lord in prayer one more time before we get started. Father, we just want to say thank You, God, that, um, Lord, we have a good, good Father like You. And Father, today we, we not only celebrate the earthly fathers that You have blessed us with, but Father, we celebrate You. And God, we thank You for Your love and Your tender care in our lives. We thank You for Your protection. We thank You for Your provision. God, we thank You, God, that um, You know exactly what is good for us. And Lord, You give and, and sometimes You take away, but You always know exactly what we need. And Father, we thank You. We thank You, God, that um, we are Your children. And Lord, I just prayed this morning that You would help us to, um, to hear from You. Lord, I pray that we would understand that this, this is more than just a book that we're fixing to read and study, Father. This is Your living Word. Lord, this is You speaking to us, and You said it is alive. And so today, even though it has been written ages ago, it still has power behind it when it speaks. And it is still You speaking the same today as You were back then. And so, Father, I just pray, God, that You would help us to, to get instruction from it. Father, I pray that You would help us to get wisdom from it, to get correction from it, to get encouragement and hope from it. And Father, I just pray today that when we leave here, we can say it has been good to be in Your house and that we have heard from You and that we are changed by being in Your presence. Father, help us to accomplish that today. That's our goal. And Father, we pray for those today that are, um, that are hurting, Lord, for their fathers are no longer with them here on this earth. And God, my prayer is that You would help them to, 
uh, to grieve, but to be able to look back on the memories that you blessed them with. Father, I pray that today would be a day that, Lord, they could still give thanks to you for the blessing that you gave in the life of their father. Father, for those who have never had an earthly father, Lord, we pray for them this morning, God. And Lord, we thank you that you said you're a father to the fatherless. And Father, I thank you, God, this morning that no matter what, when we look to you, we have always had a father. Father, I pray, God, this morning that you would help us to be able to focus on those things this morning and celebrate you, celebrate our fathers, and even celebrate our fathers that are gone to be with you. Father, we love you. We ask you to accomplish these things for us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to be talking this morning about the discipline of our good father. That's the title of our message this morning, the discipline of our good father. As children, you might remember, some of you, some may not, but if, uh, if you had a parents like I had growing up, there were times in your life that um, your parents had to correct you. Now, I know some of y'all were perfect kids in here and your parents never had to do anything. I was not one of those kids. And so um, if you had good parents, good parents were always uh, understanding that children need discipline, children need correction, and children need to be um, guided along the way. And good parents and good fathers do that. And sometimes, in order to do that, how many of you know that sometimes we have to take things away from our kids? I know for me, my dad usually felt like a good beating was the way to go. <clears throat> but there were occasions that, uh, that they would add to that beating a, um, a, a grounding of some kind or taking something away that I enjoyed, a, a play time with my friends or uh, toys that I liked or... Uh, there was always times that they were always going to do whatever was necessary to keep me from going down a path that was not good for me, but would ultimately uh, possibly mean my harm, either now or in the future. And so good parents are always trying to instruct and they're always trying to discipline their kids. And so last week, I want you to remember that we saw in Isaiah chapter 1 that God brought his children into a courtroom scene and he wanted to present a case against them. He wanted his children... Now remember, when we're reading Isaiah, he is going to address later on in Isaiah all of the world and all the nations, but ultimately Isaiah is uh, God is speaking to His children through Isaiah. Alright? He's not just talking to the world. He's talking to people and children that belong to... Him. He has chosen them. He is their Father. And so He brings them into this courtroom scene and He presents a case against them. And basically, He tells them that they were rebelling against Him, that they were laden with sin, just weighed down with sin, that they had forsaken the Lord, that they had despised Him, that they had turned their back on Him. And you can find all this in chapter 1 if you want to go back and read that for yourself. And his urge to them was that they would plead guilty and that they would repent. And if they would do so, no matter how much trouble they had gotten themselves in, no matter how bad they had stained themselves, he would take it and wash it white as snow when he would cleanse them and forgive them of it all. And how many of you know, ain't that a way a parent is, a good mother and a good father? Yes, our children can get out there and do the worst of the worst. And at the end of the day, that's still your baby, ain't it? That's still your child. Are you disappointed? Yeah, you're disappointed. Are you hurt? Yes. Is your heart broken? Yes. But that's still your baby. And this is the way that God is looking at His children right here. He wants them to recognize it, plead guilty, turn away from it. And God promised that He was going to do whatever it took to turn them away from this trouble. God was not going to just sit back and watch His children destroy themselves. Any parents in here know what I'm talking about? And you will do everything in your power. You would even give your own life if it meant protecting your child, right? And this is what God is trying to do and He's trying to show them this. He tells them in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 25-28, through 28, he says to them, I will turn my hand against you. In other words, even if it means I've got to turn my hand against you, I will do whatever it takes to save you from this. 
I will turn my hand against you. I will smelt away your dross. In other words, he's using imagery here of a of a um, refiner that's taking metals, uh, silver of some kind, and he's putting it into a fire. And what comes to the top are all the impurities, the dross, the things that don't belong. And he can wipe that stuff away. And he's saying here that I will turn my hand against you, if that's what it means, to take the impurities out of your life and to put you on the right path. He says there again, I will smelt away your dross as with lye. In other words, a very strong cleansing agent. No matter how strong of a cleansing agent it takes, that's what God's going to use to make sure His kids get on the right path. Any parents in here know what I'm talking about? All right. And He says, I will remove all your alloy or all your impurities. I'm going to take care of it. Then He says in verse 26, I'm going to restore your judges as at the first, your counselors as at the beginning, and afterwards you are going to be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. You hear what God's saying? God's saying, I'm not going to give up on my children. I'm not giving up on them. And then in verse 27, He says, Zion shall be redeemed. And it's going to be by justice. And those in her who repent are going to be redeemed by righteousness. But the rebels and the sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. So again, He's going to restore and redeem all of His children who repent. And He's going to destroy all mankind and all humanity who continue to rebel and continue to forsake Him. And that's ultimately where He stands on it. But He's going to do whatever He can. Just like any good father would, He's going to discipline them to lead them to repentance. Now this book teaches us something. I want you to get an overall view of what His children are actually doing in this book before we get into chapter 3. Now they're teaching us that Israel and Judah's real problem was that they were guilty of not trusting the Lord for everything in their lives. They weren't looking to the Lord for their daily bread. They weren't looking. You remember how it was in the wilderness when He brought them out of Egypt? And He said to them, you go out every day and you only collect enough for that day. You remember why He wanted them to do that? Because every day He wanted them continuously understanding that unless the Lord gives it to you, you're not going to have it. It's not by your strength. It's not by you going out and getting as much as you can. It's not by any power. It's not by you going to your jobs to to do the best you can to make money to provide. If the Lord don't provide it, you don't have it. And He wanted His children to understand that every day they came back to His Father and said, as Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, give us this day our what? Every day. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. And when you get up again tomorrow, you know what else you need? Don't say daily bread because you do need that, but you need your Father. Your Father is the one that's going to give you your daily bread. And God wants you continuously, every day, coming back to Him, trusting Him, trusting Him, trusting Him, knowing that He is your security, knowing that He is the one that gives you everything that you need, that He is the one who protects you and He provides for you. And every day you keep coming back to Him because you need Him for everything in life. Do you know this morning that if God does not give you your very next breath, you're not going to take it? If at one moment God says, I'm not going to give you breath anymore, you will breathe your last. And that will be the end. And so we depend on God for everything. But they failed in that. Here's what they began to do. They began to look and see that they were blessed and they had food and they had water and the crops had done good and they were able to store up and and they didn't go to God anymore for any of this stuff. Instead, they started looking and saying, man, we've got great leaders. Look at what our king has done for us. And look at what our, our local governors and our mayors have done for us. And look what our judges do. And our land is so blessed because of all of the things that we do. The work of our own hands. I get up every day and you know the reason why my kids eat? Because I work every day. You believe that? I do work every day, but is that the reason my kids eat? My kids eat because God gets me up every day. 
gives me strength in my legs to be able to get up and go to work every day, to be able to continue day after day and be able to produce income. And it always comes back to He is the one that has done this for me. And they begin to step away from that, as everybody does. So, look at with me at Isaiah 2, verses 6 through 8, and you'll see some of this. He says, For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east, and of fortune tellers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with the children of foreigners. <coughs> so think about that for a minute. He's saying here that basically... They're not turning to the Lord to figure out what they need to do and how things are going to go. Where are they going? Fortune tellers. And then, not only that, but they're not looking to the Lord for their safety and the security and for the things they need. They're shaking hands with foreigners, with the enemies, and they're making deals with them. Why are they doing this? Well, look at verse 7. Because their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses and there is no end to their chariots. In other words, where do they believe their security and where do they believe their safety comes from? From worldly things. As long as we have friends that have silver and gold, we're going to be just fine. As long as we have friends who have horses and chariots, even if they don't serve our God, we will yoke up with them and we will stay with them and together we will be safe. And yet the whole time they don't realize that they're turning away and they're walking away from God. And then notice in verse 8, their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands and what their own fingers have made. In other words, they don't look to the true God. They make their own gods and they decide that this is where I'm going to go to for my blessing or my satisfaction, or my supply, or whatever it is that I need in this world. Look at chapter 2, verse 11 through 17. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of man shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Against all the cedars of Lebanon... He's going to start talking about all the great things that they put their trust in, that they magnify and glorify because they have these things. He says, against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains and against every uplifted hill, against every high tower and against every fortified wall. Again, high towers and fortified walls is where they're looking to for their safety and security. Next week in chapter 6, when we go there, we're going to see that, that Isaiah gets this vision in the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah had reigned for 52 years in this land, and throughout this time, he had enlarged their borders, the kingdom had grew, he was a good king, he followed God, and God blessed them as a nation. And as the nation grew, um, Hezekiah, uh, I'm sorry, not Hezekiah, Uzziah had developed... Um, high towers that sling stones and fortified walls for the cities, and they begin to look at it as if this is who has done this for us. And the reason why we're so blessed is because we have good leaders in there. How many people in here today, don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass you, think, well, if Trump gets back in office, we're going to be all right. I'm just going to leave it right there. I'm not going to say nothing else. Can I tell you this morning that Trump is not going to save you? And you're going to see here in a minute why Biden's in office. But we're not going there yet, All right, <clears throat> We'll get there in a minute. But keep going with me. In verse um, 16 of Isaiah 2, "...against all the ships of Tarshish and against all the beautiful craft, uh, and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of man shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day." And then, if you would, skip down with me to verse 22. Because here's the point. Here's what God is trying to say to His people. Stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath, for of what account is he? That's including you looking at your leaders. That's including you looking at your own strength, your own ability, your fortified walls, your city, the work of your hands. 
all the things of the world, that is not where your security comes from. That is not where your safety comes from. That is not where your satisfaction should come from. And he says, stop it. Because what you're doing and you don't even realize it is you're turning your back on me. You're forsaking me. My children are not coming to me understanding that I am their father and I will supply for them and I will care for them and I will protect them and I will provide for them. Look with me at one other place, Isaiah 31, verse 1 through 3. It says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. In other words, when danger come against them, did they go to the Lord for their safety? No, they went and got their gun. Sound familiar? When danger comes my way, do I look to Him? No, we look to our military. We look to our great strength. We look to our leaders and our president. And He says here, woe to you. He says, and yet He is wise and God brings disaster. He does not call back His words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. In other words, God is the one who is going to to bring safety. Then go to verse 3. The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out His hand, the helper will stumble. In other words, I don't care if you've got a gun in your hand when the enemy comes. I'm not saying I'm anti-gun. I'm not saying that. I'm not. Come to my house and you'll see real quick, I'm not anti-gun. All right, But I am saying at the end of the day, that gun is not my safety. That gun is a piece of metal that can fail and misfire at any second. Where is my safety and where is my security? It ain't in man. That's flesh, not spirit. But when the Lord stretches out His hand, the helper will stumble and he who is helped will fall and they will all perish together. What's the point? The point of the book Isaiah is you're not trusting in me. You're not following Me. You're not looking to Me. You're not understanding that your only hope is God. That's it. As I said before, if He don't give you your next breath, you don't take it. And how many of us don't understand that? How many of you got up this morning and you have not prayed yet and even said, God, thank You for this day? Or even said, God, give us this day our daily bread? Or even said, God... Your will be done in my life. Not my will, your will be done. The fact of the matter is we don't get up and we don't look to God, our Father, and understand that He is our safety. He is our security. He is everything I need. And if I don't have Him, I don't have anything. Let's go now to Isaiah chapter 3. And we're going to see the details of God's turning His hand against them and what it's going to look like when God takes away, just like a good father will do, takes away things to try to teach His children the right way. And so here's what He takes away. In um, Isaiah chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, notice what He says here. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is what? Taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah. What's He taking away? I'm going to take away support. I'm going to take away supply. I'm going to take away all support of bread. And I'm going to take away all support of water. In other words, God says, because you are trusting in your own crops and your own strength and your own jobs and your and because you are trusting in yourselves and not looking to me, I'm going to take away your false sense of security. I'm going to show you exactly how much security you have. Does it matter how strong you are if there is no rain on your field? Does it matter how strong you are if all the water dries up and there is nothing to drink? No. And God says, I'm going to show you your false sense of security. And so the first part in our outline of verses 1-7 through is God takes away their security. Their security is not in God being with them. Their security is in their food supply. Their security is in their jobs. Their security is in their good leaders. 
Their security is in their fortune tellers, their magicians, and all these things that are not of God. And he's fixing to take it all away. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says next, he says, "...the mighty man and the soldier, the judge and the prophet, the fortune teller and the elder." In other words, I am going to take away the leaders, the leaders in your community that you put all your trust in. Remember, when you get to Isaiah chapter 6, you could look over and read it for yourself. In verse 1, Isaiah says, he got this vision in the year that King Uzziah died. This king that's 52 years had expanded everything. Their trump, if you will. <laughs> I'm going to make some of you mad today, ain't I? Y'all, y'all let me preach to you though, won't you? Don't, don't let me itch your ears. Let me be straight with you. Alright? Because I ain't a Biden man, that's for sure. Alright? But, this was their trump. This was their Savior of the nation. And God took Him away. And God takes away all the other leaders in this place as He comes in. Um, In Amos chapter 4, I believe it was, God had done the same thing to Israel. Now remember, I told you last week, in Isaiah, He's talking to Judah, the southern tribes. All right. Amos, on the other hand, is talking to Israel that this has already been done to, to try to turn them around, but they didn't turn around. Now, Judah still has hope. The southern tribes still have hope. And so Isaiah is trying to warn them. But Amos is telling Israel, this is what God has already done to you. He says, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. You know why they had clean teeth? They didn't have nothing to eat. You don't have nothing to eat. You ain't getting food in your teeth, are you? He says, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. I gave you lack of bread. Notice that. God's saying this like it sounds like a good thing, don't it? I gave you lack of bread in all your places, yet what? You did not turn to me. This is what He's fixing to do to Judah. He says in verse 7, I also withheld the rain from you when there were yet three months to harvest. I would send rain on... I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain, and the field on which it did not rain would wither. And then verse 8, So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied, yet you did not return to me. In other words, he cut off all their supply, right? And then he says, I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens, your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured, yet you did not return. What's the point God's trying to make? I took all these things away from you because I was trying to get you to turn back to me. I was trying to get you to come back to me to realize that you don't even take your next breath unless I give it to you. And so Amos tells them that. Now, back in Isaiah chapter 3 again, God takes away their supply. They don't have food. They don't have water. God takes away their leaders or He's going to take it away. He's going to take away the mighty man in verse 2. The soldier. You know why He's going to take that away? Because they honestly believe this is what keeps them safe. The mighty man and the soldier. How many of you are thankful for our United States military? How many of you know the truth of the matter is they are not in control of your safety? Can God use them and will God use them? Yes, He will. But at the end of the day, God is the only one in control no matter how big your military is, no matter how big your arsenal is. God is the one that gives us our safety and God takes it away from from Judah. He takes away the judge and the prophet. There's no justice in this place anymore. He takes away the fortune teller and the elder. Again, they don't turn to God, they turn to their fortune tellers. God takes it away. He takes away the wisdom, the elder, the wise people. Verse 3, He takes away the captain of their armies. He takes away all the men of rank. He takes away the counselor that they go to instead of God. He takes away the skillful magician. He takes away the expert in charms. He takes away all of their leaders that they turn to. Everywhere they would go except to the Lord. How many of us when we get in trouble with something, do we turn to everything else in the world except for God? 
And this is the problem that we've gotten into here as a nation ourselves. And then in verse 4, look what he does next. Not only does he take away, but he gives them something. And I will make boys their princes, and infants shall rule over them. You know what he's saying here? I'm going to take your good leaders away, and I'm going to put immature leaders in place. Am I getting on your politics yet? I'm going to take your good, strong leaders away. I'm going to take the ones away that have the potential to be able to bless you and make things good. I'm going to take all that away because that's what you trust in. And I am going to put... You know what my struggle with... uh, And and God forgive me, I'm not getting political here this morning, okay? Because I don't care about none of that. But I remember back, one of the things that troubled me about the administration when Trump was in office was that so many Christians lifted Trump up as a God. The Christians looked at him and said, oh, he he does this and he does this and he stands for this and he stands with Israel and he's, he's this and he's this and he's this. And am I saying that those are things to not to be thankful for? No, but the problem was the mentality of Christians in the United States was not thanking God and trusting God for His provision and His protection and for the things, but instead it was as long as we have Trump. Can I tell you something? Trump is a sinner just like you and me. He is a man in whom breath is in. And Trump is not the Savior of the world. God takes things like that away and He puts in place instead boys to be their princes, infants to be their rulers, immature, weak, foolish, godless. That's what these kind of leaders are. And so He could be talking about young rulers here because uh, Israel and Judah did have young rulers. They had some kings that were 12, 8 years old even when they became king after this. But the fact of the matter was, it still represented their immaturity, their weakness, their inability to be able to lead in godly ways. And that's exactly what God puts in office. So what does God do when He disciplines a nation that is turning away from Him? He takes good leaders out and He puts bad leaders in. Sound familiar? Keep going with me. And here's the result of that next. The result of that, and the people will oppress one another. The people will oppress one another. Everyone his fellow and everyone his neighbor. Y'all notice here today that we are this close to a civil war? This close. Everything is divided by race. Everything is divided by nationalism. Everything is divided by politics. Everything is divided. And men oppress one another. And this is the the social degrading that we see take place as as God removes good leaders and He puts bad leaders in place. And we're going to see this take place. People will oppress one another. And everyone his fellow, everyone his neighbor. And notice what happens next. And the youth will be insolent. You know what insolent means? Audaciously rude. The youth will be insolent to the elder. No respect for the elder. And the despised will be insolent or audaciously rude and disrespectful to the honorable. Have you noticed today the attitude toward what used to be honorable, our policemen? Today, we have more respect for the criminal than we do for the law. That's the truth. And this is the result of a nation that is turning its back on God and is quitting trusting in God and looking to God day after day after day for God to be my security, for God to be my protection, for God to be everything that I need in this life. All my hope and my trust is in Him and Him alone. And we have walked away from that, ain't we church? We've walked away from that. And we've put our trust into our jobs, into our ability to be able to provide for ourselves and into leaders that are in place. And we put all of our trust into everything 
except God, our good Father. And then notice what happens next. The next thing we see is um, uh, society degrading. I didn't mention that one to you, but here's, here's what you basically happen. And so you have this um, generational thing that keeps happening so that each generation uh, is a little more lawless than the generation before it. And you see it. You see it. Every generation that comes is a little more lawless than the generation before them. And Romans 1, chapter 28 talked about that. Romans 1, 28 um, through 31. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, is that not what I'm talking about this morning? God gave them up to a debased mind, degrading, to do those things which ought not be done. Let's see what some of these look like. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Do you not see that in the world today? They were filled with evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. They're slanderers. They're haters of God. They're insolent, as we just talked about a minute ago. They're haughty. They're boastful. They are inventors of evil things. And then let's, let's just zone in on this last one for a minute. <laughs> they are disobedient to parents. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. This is the degrading society that when God gives a nation over to their own debased mind, this is the direction that it goes. Now, this is this society that is just degrading, and this is what we get to see in our society right now. And then look at verse 6 and 7. Here's another one that's going to ring a bell to you for the discipline of God on a nation, His children. Verse 6, For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak. You shall be our leader, and this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. In other words, they see a brother. Remember, everything's been taken away from them. They're in famine. They're, they're in drought. They're, their leaders have been taken away. Um, they've been stripped of their belongings, and so they don't even have good clothes anymore. But yet, they see a single brother because all their leaders have been taken away that they trusted in. Y'all stay with me. They see a single brother. And they look and they see that their brother has a cloak. In other words, he's still just a little bit better off than the rest. you know what that must mean? That must mean that He can save us. That must mean that if we'll put our trust in Him and make Him our leader, that He will bring us out of this mess. So they're still in this mentality, right? And so they take and they see their brother that has a cloak and they say, hey, I know this is just a heap of ruins, but we're going to make you the ruler over it. Lead us and, and bring us out of this mess. How many of us are doing that today? We're just thinking, maybe the next leader that runs for president in 2024 is the one that's going to bring us out of this mess. Can I please tell you that that's exactly what they were doing? And instead, look what happened in verse 7. Go with me to the next verse. In that day, he will speak out. Who will speak out? The brother that they grabbed. They said, be our leader. He will speak out. Here's what he'll say. I will not be a healer. I'm not, gonna, I'm not the one. He said, I don't want to lead. I'm not going to be a healer in my house because there is neither bread nor cloak and you shall not make me leader of the people. Here's the point. In this kind of society where God begins to do this, men no longer want to take responsibility. Men no longer want to lead. Men no longer want to step up. Men never, no longer want to be responsible for anything except themselves. There's no bread, there's no cloak in my house, don't depend on me. I'm going to take care of me, you take care of you. Men have an every man for himself mentality. And can I say to you this morning, that is not what men were created to be. Men were created to be leaders. Men were created to take responsibility and lead in the home first and then in the society. Men, biblical men, are supposed to be leaders in protection. They're not supposed to be people that step back and say, no, 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 you get somebody else. I, I don't want to do this. Men are supposed to be created to be in the image of God and they step up and they lead. They step up and they take responsibility. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden whenever uh, Adam and Eve had sinned and God came walking through trying to find them? He didn't call out and say, Eve, where are you at? 
What did he say? Adam, where are you? Why? Because God is calling the leader to, response, to, to his responsibility. And then when he gets there, he hands out the punishment for their sin. And you remember what he says to Adam? He says, because you listened to the, wi- to the voice of your wife, this is what's going to happen. In other words, Adam, you were supposed to be the leader. You were supposed to be the protector. God had gave Adam the command in Genesis chapter 2 that you do not eat from this tree or you will die. It was Adam's responsibility to lead his family, to protect his family. And you know what Adam was doing while the snake was sitting there talking to his wife? Standing right beside of her, not doing a thing. He failed in his protection. And listen, in today's culture, I know people don't like this, um, men and women alike, you have many that are uh, a feminist, and I'm not saying that, that, that there's not been some justification for a feminist movement, because let's just be honest, men, we have ruled over women. We have not lovingly served them the way that God would have us to do. Amen? And so, we are the cause of a lot of this. But how many of you can at least relate to this? Let me paint a picture for you, All right. Let's say me and my wife are laying in bed at night and um, it's, it, it, we're dead asleep and we've been woken up by a door busting open into our house. I crawl up into bed and hug my knees and I look at my wife and I say, baby, get the gun and go see what that is. <laughs> what are you laughing for? What? Is that a problem? Everybody knows that's a problem. Why? Because everybody knows that it is the man's responsibility to get his butt up out of that bed and to go see what just busted that door down, right? And any man that sends his wife to check on that first, thank you. (laughs) He ain't a man. This is the reason why, I'm not against women in the military, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that a nation that sends its women over first to fight for our freedoms, somebody please tell me you understand that there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. Men, you were created (laughs) to lead in protection. Men, you were created to lead in provision. You remember what Timothy said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, I believe it is? He said, if a man does not provide for his own household, he is worse than an unbeliever. He didn't say, if a woman don't provide... Now, am I saying that a woman can't provide for her household? No. She is the helpmate. And she indeed can come together with her man and they can join together. Or sometimes in this cursed world, she has to do it alone. Amen? But at the end of the day, if a man has a household and barring some medical reason or some reason why he is unable to provide, if he does not provide for his household, the Word of God would say to you this morning, you are worse than an unbeliever. Men are responsible for provision. And so we have here a responsibility of men to step up and to provide and to protect. Men are to lead in the discipline and the teaching of their family. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4 says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. And then it goes into the last verse and it says there, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath but train them up in the admonition and the instruction of the Lord. In other words, fathers, you carry a primary responsibility for the discipline of the children. You lead in it. Now, does that mean that women can't discipline? No. No, women do discipline. And women come right along beside and they work together in this. But the fact of the matter is, men, you were created to carry the lead role. And when men in a society say, I don't want to step up, I don't want to lead, somebody takes them by the the collar and says, you be a leader, you step up, and they cower down and say, I don't want to lead, pick somebody else. 
That's a problem. That's a problem. And that's the kind of society that a lot of us are living in today. The Bible tells us that men and women are to equally submit to one another. It's not that one is greater than the other. It's not. Men and women are equal, both created in the eyes of God, in the image of the Father. All right? He said, let us create them in our image. But at the end of the day, equal does not mean same. Men were created for one purpose. Women were created for another. And we get the answer to that image in Ephesians chapter 5. You remember whenever God, uh, whenever Paul spoke to us from there and he said, listen, men or women, the example of the way that you submit to your husband is by looking at the way the church submits to Christ. In other words, when you look at the way the church loves Christ and honors Christ and walks along beside of Christ and follows Christ and helps Christ with His mission and goes out and, and makes sure that He fulfills the purpose of Christ in the world, this is the way that the woman does. She comes right along her side of her husband and she helps with that. But on the other hand, men, how is it that you take your example of submission? Well, look at the way that Christ loved the church. And look at the way that He gave Himself for her. And look at the way that He was willing to give His life to sanctify her, to wash her. In other words, the fact of the matter is, husbands, you take the lead responsibility just as Christ is, but how do you lead? You lead by giving yourself for her. You lead by making sure that everything you do is for her. And then, women, how do you submit? You do it by coming along beside of Him and joining Him in His mission as He protects and provides and does all the things that God has led Him to do in this world. Does that make sense to anybody this morning? <clears throat> and so men no longer take responsibility right here. Biblical men are leaders in the family. Biblical men are leaders in the society. But what happens when men just want to make sure that they have their own food, their own clothes, but I don't want to lead nobody else in the family? Well, they become like Al Bundy. Y'all know the men of Andy Griffith and the men of Father's Knows Best. Y'all know those, those, there's very few of them left. Y'all know that, right? We're in a society now where men don't want to take responsibility. Lord have mercy. We're in a society where men don't even want to be men. <clears throat> I don't even know what else to say. Society crumbles whenever this happens. Did you know today that there are 18.4 million children in America that have no biological step or adopted father? That's one in every four child today in America that have no father. And we're going to see how bad that is here in just a minute because men don't step up and lead. Children with no father are four times at greater risk of poverty, four times at greater risk of having behavioral issues, going to prison, committing crimes, using drugs, dropping out of school. Fatherless children, listen to this. Fatherless children make up 63% of youth suicides. That's a pretty high per percentage, ain't it? 63% of, of youth that commit suicides didn't have a father. They didn't have a father. Is there any correlation? Seems to be to me. Did you know that 90% of runaways have no father? 90% of runaway children have no father. 85% of children with behavioral disorders have no father. 71% of high school dropouts had no father. 70% in the juvenile detention today have no father. These are pretty high percentages, ain't it? 75% of youth in rehabs today have no father. 75% of them have no father. Men, God designed us to take responsibility. God designed us to lead in our families. And a sign of God's discipline on a nation is when men begin to say, I don't want to lead, I don't want to take responsibility, somebody else do it. We don't need men like that. Church, we need to be raising up men who will lead their families in Christ-likeness, who will lead their family to teach them, to provide for them, to discipline their children. We need men 
that step up and lead in their biblical responsibilities. And it begins right here in the house of God with people who are being taught the ways of Christ, how are being taught how to father the way that God fathers us. Men, we don't just need men who get up and teach our children that the way you survive is you just get up and go to work every day. And ain't that the way we teach our children? We teach our children, here's the way you survive, here's your security, you get up, you go to work every day. Well, is that a good, good thing to teach our children? Well, yeah, I want my kid to get up and understand that it's good to, to work hard every day. But at the end of the day, I want my child to understand that I get up and I thank God for the strength to get up. I get up and I thank God for a job to go to. I get up and I thank God that I'm able to lead my family and provide for my family because of what He does for me. I get up and I make sure that my child hears me praying, Lord, this day give us our daily bread. If You don't give it to us, we're not going to have it. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know when the last time my kid actually heard me pray that. What does that tell you? That tells you that my kid is learning from me, your pastor, He's learning that the way that you get through this life is you depend on you. You depend on the strength of man. You depend on a good job. You depend on a hard work ethic. And again, are those things good? Yes. But at the end of the day, I want my kid to understand that if God does not give that to me, if I don't follow Him, we don't have anything. We don't accomplish anything. We need men who will lead because they look to God for everything and their children see that. Y'all understand what I'm saying? That's the kind of men that we need. We don't need Al Bundy's. That's not the kind of men we need. Verses 8 through 12. How'd we get this way? This is the outline. How'd we get this way? Look at verse 8. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying His glorious presence. In other words, how do we get this way? Well, they didn't want God. They didn't want His glorious presence. They defied it. They didn't want Him in their lives. They didn't want His ways. And this is the problem with much of the world today. These people were going to church. They were listening to messages. They were worshiping. But nothing was ever changing in them to follow Him. Look with me if you would, uh, one more scripture at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 9 through 13. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 9 through 13. He says, For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers or to the prophets, Do not see. And to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions, preacher. Leave the way, preacher. Turn aside from this path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness. And how are they trusting in oppression? Because they're trusting in their government and the things all around them. He said, because you do that and you trust and rely on them, I'm going to bring destruction, basically. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall, bulging out and about to collapse, whose breaking comes suddenly and in an instant. In other words, I'm going to turn my hand against you and I'm going to show you what it looks like when I take all these things you trust in away from you. And I think that's what we're seeing take place in America today. We're seeing all these steps happen. And then in verse 9, he says, For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. In other words, they're proud of their sin. You see that anywhere in America today? I think we're in pride month right now, right? And then in verse 10, Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. But woe to the wicked! it shall be ill with him. For what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. In other words, they're going to reap what they have sown. Look at verse 12. My people, my people, infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. 
Sound familiar? Everything is upside down. Why is it upside down? I believe personally because we are just like the nation of Israel right here. We're just like the nation of Judah, excuse me. And we have turned our back on God and we have put our trust and our hope in everything in this world except for Him. And I believe this is why we see it today. I wished I had time to go to the last part of the outline, but I don't. God takes away women's beauty. I'm not going to get on the women this week. Come back next week. (laughs) I guess if I had to close with this, and I wrote a closing down, I'm going to focus on the men right here in this closing. When a nation stumbles and falls by rebelling against God, not wanting Him or His ways, judgment and discipline are coming. And men, here's the action that you take. Don't keep trusting in your strength, your jobs, your abilities, or leaders in this country for your security. And I know some of you say, well, I don't really do that. Yeah, but you are if you're not looking to God every day and you're not understanding that I need Him every day of my life for these things. They're just there. And they're there because we've had good leaders and because of this and this and this. And now they're not there because we have bad leaders. No, the truth of the matter is, I believe they're not there because God has taken it away. That's my belief. Men, don't trust in these things. Don't be focused on these things rather than being right with God and seeking Him. Seek the Lord, follow Him, look to Him for your security. Lead yourself and your families in godliness. Let your children see you trusting in Him. I want my son to see me Trusting in God day after day after day. When my family has struggles, when my wife is crying, I want my son to see that his daddy turns to the Lord. Wouldn't that be something? I'm telling you, I got really convicted whenever I, whenever I studied for this message right here because I learned that my family don't see that. They don't see that. Now, do I do that a lot? Why, yes. But my family don't see it the way that they should. Men, we need to be the kind of people that no matter what we face in this life, no matter what we're going through, that our children and our family sees that we turn to the Lord and we understand that He is my only hope, He's my only trust, He is my only security, He is my only satisfaction in this life. And if I don't have anything else in this world, if I have Him, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Let them see you praying to Him for your daily bread and for your family's safety and security. Seek Him and His ways as you lead. Make sure they see that the Lord is your only hope in life and death. Fathers, if you can do that today, you are on the way of turning this thing around because the truth of the matter is, that's the only thing that is going to save us. It won't be leaders. It won't be rain. It won't be all the things that produce good food for us. No, the truth of the matter is the only thing that will turn it around is when men take their responsibility of leading and they lead their families and their children to trust God in everything that they do.